Well, if I can take you right back to uh, telling us a little bit about the inception of the novel, how the, how the idea came to you, um, yeah, and what your hopes were perhaps for the, for the novel at the time. Oh, my God, 40-odd 40, 40 years ago. Um, well, gosh, I first got the idea on an 11 bus going round Trafalgar Square, and it was then, a, it was just a, my sixth novel, and it was about a man with an almost perfect life, a middle-aged man, I was 30, I don't know why I focused on this middle-aged man, but anyway, who had an almost perfect life, which he, he proceeds to ruin. And I thought that was a good start. Um, and then I wrote it in 1968, and it was published in 69, it was my sixth novel, and and paperback, that was it. And then I got into television by accident, and I wrote maybe one a year, first a half hour dramatization of a short story, and then one hour. And so by the time this became the television happened, it was maybe five years later. And, and it only happened because I sent a copy of the book to Tony Warmby, because I'd worked with him on something else. And it was his idea to do it for television. And in, you know, in those five years, I hadn't thought of it for television. My agent hadn't. My publisher hadn't. It might never have happened. So, you know, to be here 40 years on is pretty wonderful <laughs> for me. I don't know about you, but it's pretty good for me. I'm very, very grateful. Uh, and what was it, do you think, that Tony Warmby saw in the novel that he immediately thought this would be fantastic on God television? Knows. Well, how right he was. Um, I don't know. I... I my influences, I think, looking back on it, are, are the sort of grand opera and Greek tragedy, really. It's that sort of stuff, I think. But he could see, he could see more than I could, or I would have suggested it. Uh, it. It really came as a big surprise, and I mean, I was thrilled, but I was more worried about the how to do seven episodes, as I'd never done a seven episode. I'd only done the odd one here and there. So it was my big break, but I didn't know it was going to be my big break. And the only the only the other day when I read the um, obituary of Rex Firkin, executive producer, um, did I discover, to my horror really, that he and Cyril Bennett, who was then in charge of London Weekend, both thought it was rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Before it was made, when Tony Warby went present, when Rex, Rex presented the idea to Cyril, Cyril and, and Rex both agreed that it was rubbish. But they let Tony meet it. They said, oh, go ahead, you know, my children, you know, do, it, do it like. I bet they, they didn't think that after 26 million viewers had, uh, had tuned it. So what do they know in their big, powerful jobs? And, and, of course, you did have a track record as a, a television writer, didn't you? Because it's quite unusual for um, the writer of a novel to be also given the task of adapting their, their own novel. But you had written uh, things like Three Into Two Won't Go, Intimate Strangers, and Helen, A Woman of Today. Yes, so, that's, that's how so I do met think, Tony. Do you think that that's what gave them the sort of confidence to say, yes, adopt, adapt the novel? Yes, I don't think they would let me do it, do it if I hadn't done those five or six other things. Although I didn't do the script for the film of, of Three Into Two, that was Edna Brown, so I must give credit to her. And I never got into movies, so it, you know, it didn't lead me into that path. But um, I was just very lucky. I think luck plays a big part in careers. Um, you know, you, everybody knows it's sort of talent and hard work, but, but the luck and the chance, like, like the title, I, you know, a book called Afternoon didn't sound very encouraging, did it? But... When I went on this walk with my mother and her dog and he went under a barbed wire fence, I just got the title. I suddenly said, a bouquet of barbed wire. And I'd just finished writing the book in longhand, would you believe? Um, and, you know, I, even when I was writing it, I got some surprises. People imagine that you plan everything, but I didn't... I mean, I knew Prue was going to die. I had to research that with doctors, but... I didn't know about Cassie and Gavin having the affair until I actually got to the bottom of the page. And I got such a shock. <laughs> so, you know, some... So, so that suggests that the way you write is you just, you, you just let yourself be inhabited by those characters and you don't know where they're going to take you necessarily. It depends how much. Sometimes you know more than other times, but you can get big surprises if the characters are really 
strong. They they can astonish you. So it's yes. quite an organic process yeah, for it's, you. It's, then. It's, yes, it is very organic. It's, I don't make notes or or um, plan it, but it, it's different with each book. But I, that's the shock I remember the, the bottom of the page, and I thought, oh my god, didn't see that coming. And, and talking of not seeing things coming, did, did you and Susan, if I can bring Susan in, in here, did you have any idea at the time uh, when it was being filmed that it was going to cause such controversy when it was transmitted? No, I didn't. I, you know, uh, as, as an actor, I just went in and played the part and played the emotions. Um, and I struggled with the character a bit in rehearsal, I remember. And then I, re I had a friend of mine who I thought was a bit like Prue, so I thought I'll be her. And so I cracked it. That's how I cracked the part. How helpful. Yes. Yeah, she's unbearable. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, <laughs> uh, but um, what was the question? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just um, thinking that the the, the press, oh the shock the shock the, and, the, and the, the time, absolutely yeah. no I, I I couldn't believe the reaction to it. And I, I still think it's something to do with Frank Finlay's magnificent acting, by the way, in close-up. He is a master of the close-up. And just seeing him there again just reaffirms it for me. Um, and just the way he looked at me gave it maybe an edge. And we were talking about this mm. earlier, weren't we? It, it just gave it an edge that... that maybe wasn't in the book, that there was a little bit more. And I think that is shocking, that idea of a father being sexually attracted to his daughter, and, and it would be now. You know, mm, that's, mm. I think it's so relevant. Uh, and it's that that the press really picked up on and yes. went with, isn't it? So, so we get yes. this whole idea of, of incest around the show. But actually, yeah. Andrea, you're, no. you're quite adamant that, that that's... A slight misreading of, of, of what you intended. You, yes, I think so, because Peter Manson is a very traditional, conventional man, and he would be shocked. He, he would deny it to his dying day, really. He would, given the chance, he would never have gone to bed with Prue. However strong his feelings, he was totally in denial. He just saw himself as a father who loved his daughter and who, was, who had married the wrong man. And there are many such fathers. And um, you know, some of my fan letters from was from were from people who had fathers like that, and they didn't think they were incestuous fathers, but they, you know, um, it's this. It's very common. This, you know, this man is not good enough for my little girl. She deserves nothing but the best, and this man is not the best. So, do you think that sort of came out? because of this incredible chemistry between Susan and Frank Probably. on screen. And do you think Tony perhaps picked up on yes. that and pushed it in the direction a little bit? I think it was bit? exaggerated compared to how it was in the book. Yes, I, I'd agree with mm. that. And I think you're right. I think Tony did. Mm. Tony won't be the director, which is fantastically directed. I, you know, I haven't seen it for so long. 30 years I haven't watched I don't sit there watching myself all the time. And... Uh, it, it's so well directed and well understood, mm. um, isn't it? He, uh, um, and of course, it, it, it isn't just about about Prue and um, her father. It's about all of them. That's what comes out from that episode I've just mm. watched. You mm. know, it's the tragedy of a family breaking up. Yes, you know? and, and 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 the emotions are still relevant now. You know. Did you did you sense that chemistry between you and and Frank and I'm you Frank. and and um, Gavin when you were filming the scenes, or is it something that you only saw when you'd seen it cut together, as it as it were? No, I think Frank and Frank and I got on because he, he's he's a terrible giggler. You wouldn't <laughs> think that, would you, from watching him? He's a we call it corpsing, and he's yeah. a terrible giggler, and so am I. So, um, in fact, actually, the the death scene, I got terrible giggles because because I had to um, <laughs> it, was, it was awful Tony Warmby got very cross with me because I had to breathe very quickly and it made me very light headed and I got terrible giggles and I had to be told off and so did Frank, can you believe we played that scene um, but maybe that was because it was a bit sad that scene when I you know, when I died, and, and sort of a release of tension, maybe. Yes, maybe it maybe it was. But Frank and I definitely got on very well, and we went on to work together in a play and in in a 
a BBC production of Dracula. He played Val Helsing and I played Lucy. So we knew each other really well. And I think that's right. The chemistry came from us. And you've mentioned your, your friend helping you get into the part. And I'm just wondering, Susan is such a psychologically complex character and she's damaged in so many ways. Prune, prune. Sorry, Prue, Prue. <laughs> well, I am, Prue. I am. In my mind, you are that person. I am Prue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Prue, Prue is so psychologically damaged in, mm. in the show and, and so man, manipulative. Mm. Uh, as an mm. actor, how do you deal with that? Because you need, in some sense, I would say, to like the person that you're playing. So how did you, mm. how did you take that all on board? She's so ambiguous ab uh, about what she does. How did you cope with that? I, do you know, I can't remember. This is, you know, it was, what, is it 40, 40, 40 years, mm. 40 years yeah, ago? And it is. I, I think I just took it scene by scene as it came up. I was aware of that she was a character who had tremendous power. And actually, I think she was a woman of her time because looking back on it, the 70s was a time, was very, very much a sort of women's liberation time. I mean, I was reading Spare Rib. I was a Spare Rib girl. And, and, um, and she was very much a woman of her time with power. Yes, she was spoiled, um, but I never disliked her. I always thought, I always thought she, I enjoyed her manipulating Good. her father. <laughs> I I loved playing it, and I loved playing the baddie, if you mm. like, mm. which she is. Must have been fun. It's great fun. The baddie parts are the best. And I need one now, Andrea. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's interesting you bring up um, Women's Lib because I was going to ask uh, Andrea, actually, it, it was that time when Women's Lib was, was really getting a, a head of steam and the, the show is very much about the power dynamic, dynamics between men and women. And I wondered whether you had been influenced by that and the times and that, that the sort of women's lib movement at all or whether that never really interested you. It was just what you felt was truthful for the characters. I don't really have theories about it. I don't think, I don't think I was influenced by the times because, I, uh, retrospectively, I can, look, I can look back and say yes, I was. But I think I was just focused on those people and that family, the problem of the, the Greek tragedy thing. Really, that this is a family and um, this is what happens to them. And uh, I mean, I, no, I, I don't. Uh, I can't. It didn't really impinge on you when you were when you were writing it. I was writing it in '68, and it was only of course, of course things had got moving, but no, I'm not very strong on sociology. I can't, I can't think of it like that. It was just those people, and mm. I couldn't dislike any of them. I mean, I can now when I watch it, but um, it's rather like being a psychiatrist. I imagine that. You can't dislike your clients, so you you know you would say you you like you enjoyed being through and I I feel that you can't you've got to see the point of view of all the characters, and and give them a, a fair deal really and not dislike them even if they're unpleasant people. Well, so, I think what's, what that's what makes it such great writing actually is that all those themes are there, but they're all so organic in the way that you that you've written it. There's nothing there's nothing sort of layered on top. It's all organic. And I, was, I was going to ask um, Susan uh, as well. That character of Prue has almost achieved a sort of a cult status over the years. Really, and I, I just wonder. How's it been for you, and what? How do you feel about Prue now, after after all those years? I feel very proud to have been in this um, because I think there was tremendous talent around it. Andrea, the director, um, the whole setup at London Week Weekend Television. I mean, it was. I'm very, very proud of it. It was what they call a breakthrough role for me. I'd done quite a lot of work up to that. I was actually 26 when I played that. Um, and play Prue, and uh, suddenly you're recognised, 26 million people you can't wander about without someone recognising you, which was a bit of a shock. Um, but I, I'm constantly asked about it. I'm proud to work with Frank Finlay, with Sheila Allen, with all of them, um, mm. and it will always be with me. I mean, it's not something that I go around thinking, oh, I wish I could leave that behind. Because there are people, there are those parts that 
some people want to leave and mm. say, this is me now. I mean, this sure. is me now, but and that was me then, but I'm proud to have been part of it. And I think we need to chuck a few bouquets at the casting director, Diana uh, Parry. Absolutely, yes. And Frank yeah. Narini, the designer, who knew it was going to be a hit. He said, I can smell it, this is going to be a hit. And I had no idea. And when they were telling me what the ratings were like, I actually said, what are ratings? <laughs> I was that green after doing you know, half a dozen other television scripts. I just didn't understand what it was all about, and it was a big shock. But they knew. And Alison, as, uh, t as TV editor of the Radio Times, you're somebody who's watched a lot of television over the oh, years. Yeah. What, what do you think it is about Bouquet of Barbed Wire that, that made it such a success? Well, I was transported this afternoon because I saw it when it first came out, and I was 15. And I, it must have gone out on a Friday night. Mm. Is that yes, it was. Yeah. It did. It was a Friday and, I thought it was Friday night. It was night. Friday. Because I had a Saturday Friday. job in a little chemist at, in the little northeast town that I grew up in. And there, were f there was me and, and five full-time women workers there. And every Saturday, we'd open the door, do the alarm, and we'd start talking about a bouquet of barbed wire. Did you see it last night? Did you see what happened? Oh, he's a dirty old man, isn't he? Because, I mean, that was, we thought that he really fancied his daughter. That was, yeah. that was so obvious yeah. to yeah. us. Yeah. And yeah. The, the other thing about it, too, is that they were, they were like sort of exotic parakeets, these people. I mean, they, they drank gin and tonics. They drank wine at home. <laughs> <laughs> they had dinner parties. It was a whole... And you just think, does everyone in London do yeah, that? Well, Which they do, yeah, obviously. Yeah, I think that's a really important down part of it, actually, and we haven't, we haven't touched on that It was these exotic yet. animals who did yeah. curious things and, <laughs> and dressed beautifully and had lovely lampshades and beautiful houses... <laughs> And they talked in this curious way. <laughs> they never quite said what they meant. Well, they never really said what they meant, but sometimes they might do. And it was all terribly polite, and the people would cry occasionally and then lash out occasionally. And it was, it was terrific. Uh, to this day, uh, it's sort of seared on my heart somewhere, Andrea, so thank you for that. Uh, and I've been, as I say, transported this afternoon because I haven't seen it since. So you think that really sort of London-centric, Hampstead, oh, middle-class... Yeah. Was, Ham was it on Hampstead Heath? Was all those walking up and down? Was that Hampstead Heath? I have no idea. It looks like it might be, yeah. But, oh, yeah, it was. It a real could have appeal been... if you were watching in Birmingham or Leeds. Or, or yeah, or Middlesbrough, where the I was. The family was meant to live in Surrey, and that's why he was meant to be coming up to the office on the train and, and walking through the park from Victoria. I mean, I... But it just confirmed what we thought. Everybody lived in London, basically. Mm. They're all sort of... Is it something I mean, to do with it being, you know, quintessentially middle class and, oh, and, their, and their whole lives fall apart and they're oh, behaving yeah. so badly? There's nothing quite the like middle class angst, yes. is there? Particularly when it's done so well. Like My parents were not giving dinner parties. So, <laughs> where did it come from? I don't know where I got the <laughs> idea, I suppose. <laughs> And do you think it contributed at the time to a real debate about the pros and cons of the permissive society? Because I was 15, honestly. <laughs> All I remember was that it was, a, it was a great show and it was... I mean, I don't know if it's... Ch I think we were talking earlier about, you know, now we've got mistresses and Dr Foster and, and Dr Foster there was a big dinner party where oh, there was yes. a bombshell, which is exactly mm. what Prue did at that mm. particular dinner party. Um, I mean, at the time, I was just interested in it as a great show because I was doing my own level, so you know, I didn't have an awful lot of time to think about the sociological aspects of it. But it was so new. I, I'd never seen anything like that before. And God knows where my parents were. I can't imagine they watched it, but um, I did. And it was, it was new to all of us. Is it, is it the sort of English Peyton Place? You know, Peyton Place was in the 60s. Mm, probably. And then, in fact, it was sort of the first... Uh, TV series dealing with um, oh, I don't know sex and emotion and emotion emotion yeah big uh, emotions I, I I mean that's what people say about it the well, we zeitgeist I mean, yeah, was right yeah, the zeitgeist do. was right about it yeah I you mean know, it was tapping I think it was tapping into the in a way I, I don't, I'm sure Andrew didn't I don't know whether Andrew meant it but it ta it mm. was so successful because there was a sort of shift in society. Yes, it's the difference between writing it in, as a novel in 1968 yeah. and actually writing it for television in 1976. A lot had changed. Yeah. But, you know, whatever I intended in the novel was completely different when we got to that the television time and it wasn't ever planned for television, so... I mean, it's, a, it's dangerous to generalise about these things, but it's very often sort of seen as a 
uh, a moment that's a shift away from uh, the sexual reserve of the British and those mm. Victorian values, and suddenly you have mm. all these millions of people tuning into Beaucaire Barbed Wire. And do you think, did you, did you sense that at the time? Was it something that really did sort of um, pick up on the whole zeitgeist of the 70s and the permissive society? And I don't think I even thought about that. I was just concerned about getting the seven scripts written and, and rewritten and ready on time and hoping it would be a success. But no, I don't think I was thinking about the 70s or the zeitgeist or anything other than I think that's been put on its survival, since. yes, yes. But, uh, mm. you know, I, I don't think any of us were thinking that at the time, but it, it, there must be some reason why it just took off like that. But I don't remember any kind of forensic sort of examination before of um, that kind of middle-class life in that way. And there's oh, a was it like current. a first of well, that? You I had could Coronation be wrong. Street, You're, didn't you? Yeah, which is not middle-class life. Uh, clear, but and the undercurrents in the way, as I said, people didn't quite say what they meant. Right previously, until everyone says what they meant, everyone said what they meant. But it was all a bit hidden, and you never quite. Even those fantastic close-ups, you still you were looking at them, going, "Are you lying? Are you telling me everything?" That was that was quite memorable, I think. And if I can um, dare to bring up the, the 2010 remake just just for a second. Um, <laughs> They, they, interestingly, very uh, seem to shy away from the, the self-abuse angle of the, the sort of, you know, the, the angle of, of um, that, that Susan goaded people to, mm. to <coughs> deliberately hurt her. Um, prune, that, <laughs> Sorry, prune, yeah. Um, Bless her. I, and I, I, just, I, I just wondered, um, was that, is that... What does that tell us about the way television has changed between the 70s uh, mm. and now? Is it, is it that they were afraid of that particular subject? Is it because of political correctness that perhaps we would feel a little bit uneasy about dealing with, with that subject? What do you think? I think the poor man who wrote the scripts for the, the remake um, only had three episodes to tell a story in and they wanted him to stick to the plot but make it different. So he had to write something that was the same but different in three episodes, whereas I had seven, so, you know, that's pretty tough. And I think he had to, the only way he could do it was by simplifying the characters so that Prue became a victim. And is it and also And she wasn't a victim that's at all. What, that, I, I didn't see it, um, because I was actually in, in the theatre, so I missed it. Um, but I heard that, that that Prue, the character of Prue, was was changed, uh, became more of a victim, mm. and I had never seen Prue as a victim. No. She, she really she wasn't, wasn't she a wasn't. victim. So I felt quite sad about that because I thought that was an essential part of the story, that she had power. She was manipulative. Mm. Yeah, she made everyone spoiled. her victims, didn't yes. she? Yes. And at the same time, Gavin became a monster in the, the rewrite. Yes. And you know, I was very keen on everybody was supposed to have good and bad characteristics as they do in real life and I had this time in, in seven episodes to deal with this but this man didn't I'm sorry I've forgotten his name and um, so the thing was greatly simplified Sarah's part was cut down and Sarah's actually quite an important character um, so you know for me it didn't work it, it moved very fast it had other twists and turns and I could see that some people might like it I'm not I had to write a piece about it I mean, what's so impressive about, about your version is that it's it's very highly nuanced, and you don't give us easy answers to anything. Mm. Uh, there are no sort of uh, everybody's motives are very complex. Mm. Uh, do you think that with television drama these days, we've become more addicted to? Knowing it's far less ambiguous than it was. We want we want every we want to know what everybody's clear cut motives are, and therefore there's far less ambiguity in television drama. Do you think that's fair to well, say? Well, there seems to be now that certain long running um, television series seem to be much shorter scenes. And I wasn't thinking about this. I just wrote what I felt like writing at the time. But I like I like the long slow scenes and the lack of music. Um, in you know making the the script almost un, impossible to hear, inaudible. Sorry, <laughs> I'm forgetting my words. I'm so overcome at being here. Um, 
I don't like the trend to have a lot of music over the dialogue, and I don't like the trend to write very short scenes. Some scenes in um, Downton Abbey, for example, there are only about three three lines, a couple of characters, they each have one line each, and then we're on to the next scene, it's just boom, 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 boom. Um, which is a very different style, shall I say. But Prue's death was very downtony. They kind of pinched that, didn't they, with um, uh, Lady Sybil, who was poorly, and she got all better, and it was all fine, oh, yeah. and then she... Mm. dead out of nowhere and that was very what happened yes. to you wasn't it you were and, all well and, and then Dr kaboom. Foster's dinner party that you mentioned yeah. that's awfully close to our dinner party which is my favourite scene actually when you, <laughs> you drop the bomb mm. <laughs> I think so. I think I think it would have been commissioned, but I think it would have been very different format. And as you say, you would have probably been asked to write shorter scenes. And um, yeah, I think I think it would have been commissioned. I don't think there's anything in it that we haven't we don't see now. I do th agree with you about London Weekend. I thought they they were a terrific company, but then I would, wouldn't I? <laughs> And ITV does make some extraordinary dramas. I've got to stick up for him. Mm. I mean, Unforgotten, just recently, it was superb. So I don't think it's and quite Broadchurch, fair, I of think, course. Broadchurch, yeah, yeah, to yeah. Just But do you think you would have been asked to tone anything down today, perhaps? Yeah. No. No, I don't, no, think, I don't so. think so. I think the other way. I think you might have been pushed to, to push it a bit um, and therefore lose the subtlety. There probably would have been more nudity, yeah. I think, because we Definitely. actually, there was a lot of talk about sex and love and emotion, but there was very little nudity, yes. very little active sex, really, yes. compared to some you get now. What about the domestic violence? Yes. Which is slightly trouble, shocking, which is troublesome. The, that that's was shocking, what I was, I was thinking pregnant. of, really. Yes. Yeah. You mean yeah. that? Yeah. That is, I, find that that one of, I find that an incredible... Crew brought it on herself, effectively, which is what we were told, mm. yes. which is trouble. It's Prue playing games and then it gets serious. So it gets out of control because of the way she behaves. So it begins as a, as a, just a normal, relatively normal, you know, the games, lots of people play, play silly games that, that could be dangerous but aren't. And then because of the way she behaves and because of the pregnancy, it becomes worse and more shocking. And mm. um, I don't know you don't plan everything, you don't even understand everything, you just have to write it, I think. Um, and, you know, my 19-year-old heroines, are, I sort of think of Prue as a heroine because she was a very obliging character to write. I mean, she was... Characters that give you a lot are usually your favourites. And um, it's so it's my 19-year-old in Ella in the, um, Three Into Two Won't Go. She caused a lot of trouble as well. Um, nowadays, I suppose it would be a 14-year-old, probably. But. Can I actually say something? It's quite interesting. I think, I mean, you know, it's just 40, 40 years. Are we saying it's 40, 40 years? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, you know, a lot has happened with social media, with communications, with information. And um, looking back at that, it was a time when people didn't say what they think, where you wouldn't have been uh, allowed to stay up and watch it. I mean, nowadays, kids can go online, and actually, unless they've got some, you know, uh, lock on it, but they can watch virtually what they want to watch, you know. And, uh, um, mm. and, and it, it, in some ways, I think it was a more innocent time. Um, you know, a lot was put under the carpet, you know, we'd... In every sense, in all life, politically, I mean, I'm thinking actually of Jimmy Savile, you know, how did he get away with it for so long? But do you know what I mean? Whereas, uh, whereas now, now it, it, it's out there, then it wasn't. And I think mm. maybe what this did was to say, this is how people are, this is how they behave. And that might be part of its success and why parents didn't want their kids to watch it. 